We're four friends with hot takes on food media. And we're here to review and recap all kinds of food shows in bite-sized seasons. Plus, virtual potlucks, cooking adventures, and food memes. Welcome to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes. Hey, it's Justine. And it's me, Meg. It's just the two of us. (laughs) It's the gruesome twosome back again. Sorry, there was almost a car alarm. (laughs) (laughs) Alert, it's just Justine and Meg. Burr, burr, burr. <laughs> That's what that was. <laughs> Our fellow bakers did not survive and they've been cut. No, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Judge Paul Hollywood cut them mm-hmm. from the tent. Yep. That's us. It's just us, the final two. No, <laughs> Amanda and LJ could not make this episode, but send their warmest regards as we are kicking off the latest season of the great. British, 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 <laughs> British. <laughs> Jabibo, the Great British Bake Off, or a Great British Baking Show, wherever it is in your region. <laughs> it's always Jabibo in the region of Pot Appetit. So uh, this is a brand new season of us, our 10th season. And uh, so yeah, we felt like returning to an, an old classic. We did uh, Jabibo in 2020. Mm-hmm. Now we're doing 2022, a.k.a. Series 13, Collection 10. (laughs) (laughs) It's not confusing. It's the one that's on right now. If you're listening to us right now, it's the one that's on Netflix right now. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, let's simplify it. (laughs) Yeah. But first, before we get into what we're doing, we're going to check in with what we've been doing ourselves culinary-wise. Meg, what you been up to? I made this recipe a few times now because I love it. It's so good. It's called Cold Noodles with Tomatoes. It's a New York Times cooking recipe. Really easy to make. It's great for warmer weather. I guess it's getting a bit cooler now, but it's a cold dish. You prepare thin wheat noodles. I used soba noodles, but you can also Mm. use somen or something similar. You cut up some fresh cherry tomatoes, radishes, scallions, and you make a broth with soy sauce sesame oil, rice vinegar, garlic, and Dijon. So it's also already vegan, so you might be interested in it. And you garnish it with some of the scallions and sesame seeds. It's really easy to make. Like I said, it's served cold, so really the only thing you need to cook is boiling the noodles for just a few minutes. I love it. I've made it, I think, two or three times. I'll probably make it as many times as I can with the amount of soba noodles I have at my house, which is a lot, (laughs) Mm. (laughs) unless I decide to make something else with soba. But if you've been following along with our Reddit talks, we recently had a talk with Chef Jihye Kim, and she was asked by a listener if there were any other Korean-American chefs whose careers she was watching and enjoyed and liked. And she mentioned Eric Kim, who is the author of this recipe. And he also created the Loft House cookie recipe that I mentioned before in a different episode, the soft sugar cookies with the raspberry icing. So I love his recipes. I will definitely be seeking out more of them. Mm, I love soba noodles and that sounds so delicious. Yeah, you should make it. It's easy. It's vegan. It tastes great. I love it. For me, I made a baked frittata with broccoli and scallions. It's one of those things where you're like looking in your fridge and you're like, this, these vegetables are about to go old and I have like a million eggs. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So let's do it up. Basically, yeah, you just pretty much saute your veggies until they're done, which as per veggie takes a very amount of time, but you can just tell easily by looking at them and then on the side you would you know beat your eggs or so I did about eight eggs Mm. and then I put them into like a greased pie uh, pan that I have a glass one but I know some people if you have like the appropriate sized um cast iron skillets Mm -hmm. you can go directly from like stovetop to oven with those uh, speaking of oven, I also completely watched all of Anthony Porowski's new cooking competition, and I forget the name of it. It's I didn't oven. even know that was a thing. <laughs> it's on Netflix. Easy Bake Battle. That's it. Anthony's got a new show on Netflix, Easy Bake Battle. It's 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 his personality, as you know and love from Queer Eye, <laughs> plus cooking competition. So everybody is very sweet and nice. 
And the thing in the show, and I would definitely like recommend it to folks like Amanda, are they want it just done in like the simplest way pro- possible. Like they'll give mm-hmm. you a prompt and they're just like, use hacks, like use like prepared package of like cake boxes or seasonings, not fresh herbs, like whatever you can do in the amount of time to make it taste delicious. Throughout the show, they're they're always like, here's my hack for doing this, you know, like that. Mm-hmm. They're just really like down home cook, making it, that's why it's an easy bake battle. <laughs> Yeah, Amanda should definitely check that out. It sounds fun. And I love Anthony's personality on Queer Eye, so that sounds like a fun show. Yeah, you would really like it, too. That's why I was like, you would like it, she would like it. I think everybody would like it. It's it's a good time. And, of course, if we've got our guest judges from our other uh, favorite Netflix competition shows, like Jacques from Nailed It, uh, Kristen Kish from the new Iron Chef, like... Mm. It's all the the Netflix cooking MCU, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally. All right. So on today's menu, mm-hmm. we've got two episodes, the first two episodes of this season of Great British Bake Off. Episode one, Cake Week, and episode two, Biscuit Week, as they always as do. As always. <laughs> <laughs> Deja vu. All right. So we're going to start off with Cake Week. And normally they start off the seasons by doing like a parody. Mm -hmm. And this year's parody was Star Wars. Star Wars. (laughs) Because it's so hot right now. (laughs) People online seem to really hate this parody. And, you know, I get it. It kind of sucked. It was something that boomers would make. But it did make me laugh. I'll admit it. Prubaka made me laugh. I thought that was funny but maybe I'm just getting old (laughs) I mean there were some chuckles in it chuckles to be had but normally they do something that's like relevant to the times and I'm like why that's the only thing I do they do something relevant to the times (laughs) I feel like at least Noel and Matt's comedy can be a little behind the times Matt especially (laughs) but who knows who wrote this skit maybe it wasn't even them Yeah, so we meet our new crop of bakers. And I think, you know, if people remember, we talked about it on one of our back burners Mm -hmm. when it came out. It's a great crew. I think it's a really good crop. I thought it was kind of a little bit of a shame that the last season we covered, 2020, seemed like maybe not the strongest group of contestants. So I'm pleased that we are covering this season where there seems to be a lot of talent in the tent. And... My initial prediction when we did briefly talk about this on the back burner was that I thought the final three were going to be Shabira, Yanush, and Sandro. And now that I've watched more episodes, I'm, you know, I think that that prediction might change, but I have to stick with what I originally said with my information at the time. But yeah, that just goes to show there's a lot of talented bakers here. I think that a lot of other bakers have moved up in how I think they might be how far I think they might be capable of going in this competition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say there was definitely like a lot of nerves in this first episode. A lot Mm -hmm. of people may not put their best foot forward because shaky hands and whatnot. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But um, I think it was a really good episode. Uh, The signature challenge was 12 mini sandwich cakes, which is, you know, something that they've done a lot, but uh, it's a classic, but it works, you know, and I think it's a great, you know, taste test, mm-hmm. essentially, for all these people to, to show off who they are. It's a great introductory episode. As much as we loved the cake busts, they were very funny and fun, but that cake bust challenge, that's kind of just setting up the bakers to fail. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate that the signature challenge, sandwich cakes, pretty straightforward. As always, they get to put their personality on it, their own spin, their own little creative twist. So starting with something simple, red velvet cake. This is one of the few technical challenges where not only have all the bakers heard of the sweet, but probably most of them have made it before. And then even the showstopper, it's kind of like a glorified gingerbread house. Mm -hmm. So all of these challenges were pretty straightforward and I really loved that. It's like, yes, just give the bakers a chance to find their feet, to show what they're capable of, and to not make it a spectacle. Exactly. I loved it for the same reasons you listed. Definitely as we compare to the 2020 cake bust. Yes. <laughs> cake bust aganda. That, like, 
that people aren't making those like really on the reg unless you're like you're a instagram influencer right these ones were definitely attainable and probably closer to stuff that they had made before and i think it really shows us that we can put an arc to the show by really topping the skills as we go you know it should be getting harder as you go it shouldn't start out ridiculous and everybody Mm -hmm. makes a bad thing you know (laughs) exactly exactly yeah i do think that the trajectory of the season already looks better from the get-go yeah the sandwich cakes i loved abdul's cacti cakes they turned out really cute (laughs) and i loved the set dressing he did too with the little spades and garden tools and stuff mm-hmm. like that that was really cute yanus's looked perfect as crew likes to say neat as a pin but they really mm-hmm. did they were gorgeous and uniform and just picture perfect and i also liked maxi's mango and passion fruit mess i thought it was very pretty and carol's bees anything with bees i'm going oh, to enjoy yeah. so much <laughs> bees this season <laughs> a lot of bees this season yes <laughs> And Sandro's flower pots, which not Mm. only looked great, but I loved the idea of a red wine ganache. That sounded very interesting. Yeah, I also, like, love the look of Sandro's. This the chocolate pots, the white roses, beautiful right out of the gate. Really impressive. I really like that Sandro is super ambitious. Like, he's there to play. You know, he's just like, this is what I'm going to do. I set my sights really high. Mm -hmm. And unlike some previous contestants in other seasons, he seems to be able to execute on his vision. Yeah. (laughs) Really ambitious, but he's able to pull it off. Yeah, definitely. I would agree in calling him ambitious. And I think, spoiler, in a couple episodes, when he's like, no, this is what I want, like, Mm -hmm. he goes for it. Yeah, totally. He's like, he's in it to win it, is what I'm saying. (laughs) He's super nanny. (laughs) Super nanny, yeah. There were a couple of folks who had some challenges in the uh, the mini cakes with uh, Will's uh, Italian meringue that kept splitting and Misa um, cutting her cakes while they're still warm and even her buttercream had curdled. Mm-hmm. It's a couple of, like I said, some nerves, some tent curses. <laughs> <laughs> the curse of the tent. I do think that even just this first episode, separated the wheat from the chaff a little bit the people who were struggling continued to struggle yeah in general so like yeah like you said about the the technical the red velvet cake as soon as i said that i was like yes yes perfect i love this i love what you're doing thank you yes. because it's also an american cake mm-hmm. so it, it's not that like far fetched that like oh it's not something that <laughs> It's not a Victoria sponge, but like, <laughs> it's not completely out of the box. There is a trick to making the red velvet, of course. There's a, a, a chemical reaction that's, that needs to happen. Yes. It was interesting, though, because the traditional way red velvet cake is made is, like you said, it's a chemical reaction that makes that red color. And they had all the elements there, I think, to do that chemical reaction, but... I'm also pretty sure they used food coloring. I tried to watch closely, but people were like, oh, mine doesn't look red enough. Should I make it redder? And I thought to myself, well, the chemical reaction either happens or it doesn't, right? You know, so I think maybe they were also using food coloring in this case. I rewatched to try to determine for sure, but I was unable to. I think so. I think they're more so not sure when to um, put in, what is it, baking powder? (laughs) Uh, what did they call it? Bicarb soda, yeah, which bicarb is baking soda baking to soda, us. Right. <laughs> you know, the the longer you can hold off on that, the the gases won't escape. So they were looking for like that that big fluffy cake. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say though, some issues I have with the technical, <laughs> like when they're like, and put a crumb on the outside, and then they look at it and they're like, but you did it wrong. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are so many ways. To interpret that. It's like, well, I feel like they put crumb on the outside, so therefore they shouldn't be docked for it. That makes me mad. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, but it's too thick here. And, oh, it's not high enough. And I'm like, but you, if you don't describe how you want the crumb on the outside, people are just going to make it whatever. 
It was really interesting to me that everyone seemed to be in agreement that it needs to be a tall cake. And it made me wonder if it said that in the brief or if that's just how they traditionally are in the UK. Because if someone had asked me to describe a red velvet cake, I don't think I would have said, it has to be tall. (laughs) You know, I would say it has to be red. So that was kind of interesting to me. Exactly. This, ugh. If people don't know how we feel about technicals on this show, they can go back to our previous I'm going season. to say more about it in the next episode, Ooh. so just wait. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but I was really glad that Shabira placed first because it was yes. such a personal challenge for her. She said that Red Velvet Cake was the first cake she ever made, and if it weren't for her friends kind of cheering her on after making this cake, she said, I don't know if I ever would have been a baker. So I thought it was a really sweet story and I'm glad that she was validated. Oh yeah. And definitely we've got some more as we go on to the season of like who knows what and who's made what. <laughs> yes. Uh... Who's made what 500 times but can't uh... execute on it. <laughs> and also, I mean like, This show can be very problematic, and I really think we should talk about that this this go-around. I'm pretty sure we did talk about it the last time we talked about it. Just basically, like, I'm not going to try to say this crude, but, like, are the black and brown people set up not to be able to succeed in a show like this? Well, if we look at Maxie, she's Swedish. Mm -hmm. I feel like the UK is very different racially than the US. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm equipped to have a thought on that right this second. Yeah, but I will note there are slight microaggressions, though, within the show where they taste somebody's flavors that may be something like tamarind or something, you know, and they go, oh, that's an interesting flavoring. Well, I will say, yes, I agree. I think (laughs) also not to slag off British people, but Prue seems like maybe has a limited palette. I do feel like Prue and Paul tend to most enjoy what is familiar to them. Yeah. I don't think that they're terribly adventurous in their flavors. Yeah. They, they say they are. They'll approach a bake and be like, oh, I've never had that before. And then they try it and they're like, mm, I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, I feel like both Prue and Paul could maybe be more adventurous in their flavors. And also, it's interesting, too, because if I were a baker on this show, the series has been going on for long enough that we do know certain flavors that these guys do or don't like just straight up, and it seems like their opinion never seems to change about it. So mm-hmm. I, w- I would never make anything floral. I would never make anything with matcha because these guys are not going to like it. <laughs> yeah, anytime. Oh, my God. It's just like... Anytime somebody uses, like, rose, which people did in a few times, I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, oh, is it good? <laughs> Don't make it taste like soap, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All these things that, of course, like, we know. And I think even um, people in the in the show stop around definitely use to their advantage. I mean, look at, like, Janusz. Basically, this was his Christmas Polish cake. That was basically kind of like a Black Forest. So Janusz is like, I'm making this because it's like, they love it. I know that they love Black yes. Forest. I say that every single season. And also, like, Sandro just putting booze in everything. Like, yes. <laughs> I will say, though, it was interesting to see them try to play the judges and then sometimes fail. Because, like, Sandro made something that brewed... Brew? <laughs> yeah, Brew might be a good nickname for Prue. No, <laughs> Sandro made something that Prue herself said was too boozy. So... I guess even knowing what the judges' preferences are, you can still run afoul of their palate. (laughs) Yeah, but as to what we were just talking about, when Shabira brought forth her milk tea and matcha cake, they said, quote, interesting flavors. (laughs) Yes, yeah, I, (laughs) yeah, Prue and Paul, I like them as judges. I like them as TV personalities. I've said before, I don't think that they are the culinary gods that they are made out to be for many a reason. And this is one of them. <laughs> so I th- <laughs> I just looked at my nose and I see in all caps, nice big nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I do like nice big nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Great editing on that part. Chef's kiss. Yeah, that was from the Showstopper Challenge. Do we want to talk about the Showstopper? Yes. The cake home. So yeah, glorified 
gingerbread house, essentially. Although, of course, not everyone used gingerbread, but I think it was a good challenge. Mm -hmm. People had lots of ways to interpret it. They could make kind of any house that they've ever felt a connection to. I really, there were little bits of people's bakes that I liked, even if I didn't necessarily like the whole bake, like Abdul's little sheep. I thought were really cute. He His oven wasn't on, so he wasn't yeah. able to execute to quite the level of detail he wanted to, but I still thought the sheep looked really cute. And he made them out of barfy. But yeah, they were, it was, that was a good use of that particular food to create the look he wanted. I liked Rebs's coconut rum rain. Rain, yeah. <laughs> that was a cute <laughs> little touch. <laughs> Don's pebble dash. I'm not sure what we call that here in the U.S. Maybe we would call it Pebble Dash. I, I think I know what she's talking about. I think I've seen homes like this. Yeah. But I feel like this is not very common in America. Or maybe not as common in the regions I've lived, at least. Well, they were joking that it probably wouldn't be common to Prue either. <laughs> <laughs> it's too. She was too posh. Yeah. <laughs> Shabira's coconut trees were cute. And, of course, Jabibo never passes up an opportunity to focus on something relatively phallic looking. They're just like, uh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Bebo <laughs> will always do that. And of course, I didn't get to taste it, but I thought that Maxie's crumble sounded really delicious. I like yeah. a crumble. I like a cake. I like the idea of combining those two. And then Janusz, his color his, and his piping were just beautiful, like... I think he took the the prompt and he made an interpretation that really worked. He didn't make like, this is exactly what a boring cement block of apartments look like. Yes, he didn't do a literal interpretation, which was nice. He definitely put his creative spin on it. It was technically very, very well executed. In general, though, I don't really like bright primary colors on food. That's not very appetizing to me personally. So objectively, yes, he did a great job. I don't think that would be the first cake I would gravitate to in terms of wanting to eat it, but I'm sure it tasted great. The judges said it did, and it was technically very good. I liked his story of saying that he could tell which flat was his mom's because there would always be flowers on the balcony, and he added oversized, emphasized flower icing to his bake. And then there were a couple things people didn't do so great, like Kevin burnt his windows. <laughs> yes. Uh, Maxie, as delicious as it was, she ran out of time and had some clumsy piping. Will overbaked his two different uh, types of cake. And my son, her cake turned out very, very dense, like a pudding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of errors here. Even yeah. though Will's cakes were overbaked and really put him in the bottom, I I enjoyed his bake because Noel commented, oh, I've seen those flats before. And I felt like I had also seen those flats when I had visited London. So I'm like, okay, either I've seen where Will lives <laughs> or <laughs> a lot of flats in London look similar, which is probably the more accurate answer. But yeah, I enjoyed that part too because I was like, oh, I've, se- I've totally seen that too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. And I mean, like, yeah, we love the challenge. Um, I definitely at this point have picked out favorites you can easily tell who was going to be star baker and who was going to get sent home (laughs) yes unfortunately and also especially in these early episodes where there are lots of bakers we Mm -hmm. start out with 12 of them so just by the nature of having 12 bakers and only so much run time for the show you notice who's given more screen time and it's like well that other me- either means they've done well or they're getting the boot so they're getting the boot edit you know like oh yeah. this poor person is only in this one episode so we better give them some screen time so yeah, yeah. I like to try and guess who's gonna get cut within like the first 30 yes. seconds <laughs> <laughs> yeah when I was watching it I was like oh it's either Will or my son once yep. well once we saw a little bit of also what they had baked because Once they struggled in the first challenge and it seemed like they had a lot of airtime, I was like, uh, I think these guys are on shaky ground. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yep. So Will got sent home and Janusz got star baker this episode. Uh, excuse me, star caker. (laughs) Oh, right. I won star caker in the bake week. (laughs) 
<laughs> that was so cute. Uh, I loved that bit. What a great way to end an episode. Such a high note. He's cute. This is, it's a lovely group of people. I really enjoyed this episode. Me too. All right, we're going to take a quick commercial break, but when we get back, it's Biscuit Week. All right, we're back. It's episode two, Biscuit Week, and our signature challenge is 18 decorative macarons. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sad that LJ is not here today because I really needed her Britishness to translate for us. <laughs> so at one point, Paul says, it's more cookie-like than it is biscuit-like. And I'm just like, what do you mean, Paul? I thought... That biscuits were cookies to British people. So I am quite confused. I need more clarification on what a cookie versus a biscuit is. All I think I know is that they definitely consider like chocolate chip cookies to be cookies rather than like a like a tea biscuit. So my best understanding, I could be totally <laughs> wrong. LJ, you can correct me in the next episode. I think that to a British person, a cookie is something soft and cakey, like you said, like a chocolate chip cookie. And then a biscuit is also a cookie, but it's something that has that snap to it. Yeah, we don't differentiate over here. No. (laughs) No, we do not. And a macaron to us, I think would just be a macaron. I don't think I would call it a cookie or a biscuit. No, I don't think as Americans we would call that a cookie. No. (laughs) No. We were like, oh, that's a fancy French thing. (laughs) Yeah, that's a whole other thing. (laughs) Also a good challenge. Mm -hmm. I do think that it was inconsistent in their judging because they said that the decoration must make the macarons look like something other than a macaron. And Carol got a handshake for her yo-yos, which look... (laughs) Exactly what? like macarons. <laughs> but with a string. With a little string. I do think her idea was clever. I like that she extruded the sugar paste. I think it was a good way to technically make something that wasn't a macaron. But mm-hmm. yeah, it, it was the most it was the most macaron-like of anything that anyone made. And yet she got a handshake in high praise. And I'm like, I don't feel like she fully followed the brief. Oh, you're right about that. I didn't even think about that. The thing that bothered me the most was that everybody had stuff that looked one way but would taste another way. And that really bothered me. Oh, the carrots that tasted like baklava. (laughs) And orange. Like, what? Yeah, I'm like, oh, I would expect a carrot to taste like carrot, but okay. (laughs) Yeah. Or the ice creams. Well, I guess the one did taste like peppermint ice cream, but... The other one, I don't believe, was ice cream flavored. No. And then, like, uh, Janusz with the watermelon. Okay, so he had, like, a flavor watermelon. He did. But then a spinach on the outside. I don't know. It seems complex. That- I liked his. So even though it was just kind of like an oblong macaron, like, maybe mm-hmm. not the most creative shape, I did think that his other touches of creativity made me like this more. I did like the decoration of the watermelon rind it really looked Mm -hmm. like a little watermelon and even though he did use spinach to color it I doubt that it would taste very spinachy okay okay that would be my guess anyway and the judges didn't try it and they weren't like disgusted like oh it tastes like spinach you know I think it might have tasted a little vegetal maybe but it sounds like it mostly tasted like watermelon if I were to make that, and of course I wouldn't because I'm not as skilled as Yanus, but I would have added black sesame seeds to make little mm, watermelon seeds. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So some, I guess it's some I like, some I was disappointed with. I don't know like why Rebs would choose to do like an all black cat. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of those things I'm like, you don't have to be completely truthful if it doesn't like look good you know yes yeah like i said primary colored foods not immediately appetizing to me solid black foods also not immediately appetizing to me the first thing i think is that it's just gonna stain my mouth for the rest of the day yeah yeah i do think that the cats themselves look cute the faces were cute i agree that maybe she didn't need to make them black even though yeah she owns a black cat and it's inspired by her cat but she yeah she could have taken a few creative liberties and the inside was a mess, apparently. The raccoon tattoo. <laughs> I love the raccoons. 
Wee baking raccoon <laughs> It's not very wee. <laughs> uh, I think I liked these the best. These were James's, the raccoons. Mm-hmm. I feel like it had the most creative shape. He definitely did a lot of pipe work to make it not look like a macaron. And um, they were a little too light on color for me. I do feel like they were a bit pale. I think that a lot of people in this challenge suffered yes. from that. Like the ice creams. Yes. I was so disappointed by the ice creams because on paper I was like, oh, these look so cute. This is such a good idea. And then both of them were really pale. Really the, pale. The cone, like Paul said, was white. I'm like, this doesn't look like ice cream to me. Yeah. I also think even like the the burgers, I know they just called out Carol's burgers for being too pale, but I think Sandro's burgers were also pale looking. I think so too. In fact, I think San- Sandro's might have been even paler in my opinion but his did have a nicer dome than carol's did. yeah i like the structure of his too rather yes. than like all that stuff on the inside that's not something i'm looking for in a macaron i do like that sandro for example like his fake ketchup or mustard or whatever it looked like ketchup it was like a sauce whereas carol's were fondant so yeah i, Ugh. Yeah, I do think that sandro's execution was better Oh, going back to the ice cream cones briefly, Abdul was saying that the first color he thinks of when he thinks of ice cream (laughs) is pink. And I was like, yes, he would love our podcast logo. (laughs) Yes, that's our ice cream color. (laughs) We completely agree with him. (laughs) I mean, like, Abdul, I love him. Love him. I really like his bakes and his personality. He He's yeah. a great contestant. If oh, I had yeah. watched a little more, I might have put him up in my predictions for the final three. But I have to go with my initial reaction from just episode one. <laughs> okay, okay. You keep holding on to that. I will. Um, I will. We'll see what happens. Shabira, I love that she decided to yes. do a savory macaron. That's so creative. I love Shabira. At, I as know. of this point, she's my fave. <laughs> I love her too. She takes takes risks she Mm -hmm. follows her heart she does really creative stuff with the brief i yeah i'm really impressed by her so far she's super creative reminds me a lot of like kim joy yes and you know i just i think we're such kim joy (laughs) fangirls it's true (laughs) but it's 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 someone who thinks outside the box someone with imagination like Mm -hmm. really bringing the fun Yeah, I really like her. And this is something I always really like about contestants is if I'm curious to know what they're going to make next. Like if I were a judge and I was having a hard time, I'd be like, well, between these two people, who am I most interested to see what they're going to bring to the table later? You know, and Shabir is definitely one of those. It's not Kevin. (laughs) It's certainly not Kevin. Uh, I would like to see what Sandra is going to make. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just be mean to the contestants, but Kevin, he just always seems so baffled by everything Noel says to him. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, have you never watched this show before? <laughs> Do you not know what to expect from Noel? He's the Noelist he's ever been. Noel's great. I love Noel. <laughs> uh, Maxie got a handshake. She did for her Daisy macarons. They were perfect. Light, summery, delicate. Way to go, Maxie. Yes, they looked r- really sweet. I mean, like, as in nice looking, (laughs) (laughs) not as in the flavor profile, although they probably were that too. You ready to move on to the technical? Yes, I am. The technical was Garibaldi biscuits. (laughs) AKA squash fly biscuits. Mm -hmm. Ew. Although props to Sandro, who actually heard of it because he was doing research, which is, as we said, if we're going on the show, yes. If it's biscuit week, you're going to look up every biscuit that's ever been invented. (laughs) Yes, and it sounds like this is a kind of common biscuit. I could be wrong, but I was looking up a little bit of it because I was not familiar. seems like this is a biscuit you can get pre-packaged a lot of places in the UK. It's maybe not as widespread as, say, your digestive or whatever, but it did seem not as bizarre as some of their other technical challenges, perhaps, although... I don't know. I had certainly never heard of it before. It's giving me, like, Fig Newton vibes. Oh, yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. But Prue decided to add chocolate decoration to this, which is apparently not the traditional way these biscuits are prepared. That threw the contestants for a loop a little bit. Yeah, and some feathering on that as well. Oh, my God. (laughs) So, legit, laugh out loud, 
uh, when Abdul and Shabira made literal chocolate feathers. I thought that was hilarious and adorable. And I loved Shabira's feathers. They, they looked were so amazing. good. They were so good. I think Abdul must have just had like feathers on the brain because his showstopper challenge was a mask entirely made of feathers. Mm-hmm. So I think maybe he was just in that headspace. <laughs> yeah, I think most of the the problems with this technical just happened with the the application of the chocolate. Like if they yes. were dipped, if they were brushing it, if they were uh, piping it. Like everybody just tried different things because the the biscuit itself, as I said, was so fiddly that yes. it was hard to work with. And how do you get something that's chocolate onto there? <laughs> yeah, and also the biscuits that were presented to Prue and Paul as like the platonic example of what these cookies should look like they had dipped them in chocolate lengthwise Mm -hmm. where it seemed like most of the bakers had dipped it at the equator i guess you would say i don't know if any of the bakers actually dipped them lengthwise or not so so yeah i feel like this challenge was a little odd for the bakers and yeah i think they did the best they could (laughs) which was pretty good overall as always but i will say in the the call out most folks who are usually at the bottom were at the top. We had some people very surprised to succeed in this one. I don't think I've ever seen anyone be so happy about placing second as James was. Yeah. <laughs> he was so pleased. I was like, well, great. <laughs> That's great that you're so happy to get second. <laughs> but again, all right, this is my comment about the technical challenge. Once again, I think that it absolutely does not weigh in the final judging whatsoever. Reb's place places first, but at the end of the episode, she is definitely on the chopping block. She is on the bottom. She is considered for going home. Uh, Yeah, this happens all the time. Someone Mm -hmm. who does well in the technical does poorly in the episode overall, sometimes even gets sent home, and oppositely, someone who does poorly in the technical might go on to win Star Baker. So... The technical challenge is, it's it's there for the spectacle, which, It you know, means nothing. It's fun, but it means nothing in the ultimate judging, I don't think. All right, so going on to our showstopper for the week, 3D biscuit masks. Yes. Like a mask at a masquerade. <laughs> As you were saying, I think this is good that they're like slowly ramping up the difficulty. This still isn't too difficult. They have a lot of interpretation here. It's like make a mask make different kinds of biscuits. The one thing essentially is that it has to stand up, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, that's that's a little challenging. But, you know, most of the show stoppers have to be displayed in in some way that is upright. So, yeah, I think it was a fair challenge to the bakers. Again, I think it was good to show the breadth of their skill. It's it's, it's something that you want, especially like in a gingerbread, for Mm -hmm. it to be able to withstand weight uh so yes that would be you know a sort of smart move to go to not everybody chose gingerbread some people chose different types of biscuit but um yeah they all had to be able to stand up and something happens at carol's station right at the beginning i felt so bad for carol she was so upset so yeah her cookie mask crumbled on the stand Paul seems to think it was because of the lard. He thought it was too soft. That could certainly be the case. Maybe it was too heavy. Maybe it was still too warm. I don't know. Maybe not too warm because she seemed to have been able to ice it with no problems. But yeah, one way or another, the stand just kind of poked through that cookie. <laughs> it was a soft. It was a soft gingerbread. And mm-hmm. I mean, this is what happens when they go around to their stations and they go, oh, is that, is that the lard you're using for that? Oh. <laughs> That's oh, another okay. sort of meta... <laughs> thing I like to look for in the edit. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. if Paul or Prue points out something in the walk around that they're unsure about, it's like a Chekhov's gun, you know, and Paul was like, whoa, lard in that gingerbread, huh? You know, and then that says in your brain, well, that's going to come back. <laughs> mm, so it yeah, did. it certainly did. Reb's mask started to break, so she had to completely start over. <laughs> I will say that I felt pretty aligned with the judges on the showstopper. The people that they put at the bottom, I also was not that impressed with. It doesn't seem like in the brief they said that the masks had to be a certain size, but both my son's and Reb's masks seemed small to me. When you looked at what the other bakers were doing, it's like, well, it seems like both of these bakers were, they set their sights a bit low. It Mm -hmm. seems a little unambitious what they've created. So I wasn't too surprised that the judges felt the same way. 
Yeah, my Sims was really simple, and she finished early. So yeah, I. Fine. she should have maybe trusted her gut a bit, because she did say she felt nervous that she had finished so early when everyone else was still working, and she was like, oh, maybe I should add more to it. And it's like, oh, yeah, maybe you should have. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know. But if you're not prepared to make more than what you've decided to make, I think that would be difficult to do. Uh, another call out I have was Abdul's quote unusual tahini flavor. <laughs> <laughs> Told you it's the microaggressions are everywhere. <laughs> That's so funny too because if we go back to our Bon Appetit days, like tahini was in everything. <laughs> bon Appetit freaking loves tahini mm-hmm, in mm-hmm. savory dishes and sweet dishes and everything. I loved Abdul's. I think that his came together so well. I Beautiful. also liked that. It was entirely made of biscuits. Like, none of his designs were fondant or icing or frosting or anything. So it was really impressive. Just, like, the colors, the visual balance, the volume. I really liked his a lot. Yeah, it was beautiful. Janusz with his cubism mask. (laughs) Again, that was, like, very technically well done. I was very impressed. Not one of my favorites, though, for some reason. But, you know, he obviously did a a great job and kudos to him. Yeah, it's cool that his style is not, like, your particular style, but, like, he's very strong in his, like, bright colors and... Yes. That's his thing, and I think we'll see a lot of that going forward. Yeah, totally. I was surprised and very impressed by James's swamp creature. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like, up until the final reveal, I was like, oh, this is going to be weird. But then the final result I thought was great, uh, very effective, and very ambitious of him to use brandy snaps, which are quite a delicate biscuit. Yeah. And I think he really, really pulled it off. Should have got more praise. I think so, too. The eyes were cool. The teeth were cool. I don't know what he made those elements out of, but I thought they looked great. Yeah. I was disappointed in Kevin's because I loved the concept of a sea siren and the concept art made it look very cool. And then the execution, I was like, oh, that looks like a blob of toothpaste. <laughs> like, I didn't see none of the nautical elements came through for me. Oh, yeah. Pretty good episode. We're yeah. starting to really see whose chops are where. So Star Baker, this episode was Maxie. Yeah, she got the handshake for the macarons, and then mm-hmm. they liked her carnival mask. It was very bright and fun, and Prue was just delighted by it. I thought it was, like, a little simplistic. I don't know. It, it wasn't one of my favorites. Like, it, it, if I were a judge, I don't know if I'd put it at the top. And also, they never talked about this, but her mask was held to the form by these big metal skewers, kind of, through the eye holes, so that the mask didn't slip down Uh and just like aesthetically I was like surely there could have been a prettier way to secure the mask to the form so uh, yeah I I felt like it could have been better I don't know it probably tasted amazing that's something we'll never know judging this series is how it actually tastes (laughs) exactly and the baker sent home this week was my who it didn't come as a big surprise the whole edit of the episode was just like Nope, she's just not, I don't want to say, she, she's not that she's not as talented. I don't think she was as experienced, but yes. she was definitely, for her age, she's 18, she's the youngest. She was killer, you know? Yeah, I mean, she fulfilled the young contestant that they tend to yes. have most seasons. <laughs> I mean, she's certainly way more skilled than I would have been at 18, that's mm-hmm. for darn sure. But yeah, we saw her struggling kind of through the whole show thus far, so... Not too surprised, but she had a great attitude. She said it's not the end of her baking journey. It's just the start. And she seemed like a lovely person, like most of these bakers seem to be. So, but yeah, not surprised. Not too sad to see her go as far as her baking abilities. Yeah. And at this point, yeah, I'm really starting to think like, who's going to go next? There are some really, really strong co- contesters here. Contesters? Cont- <laughs> <laughs> contestants um like we've been talking about unlike when we covered 2020 when it was just like what who yeah in 2020 when I was looking at who was bubbling up to the top I was kind of like well okay I guess you know whereas in this season it's like there's so many options like who's gonna make it and one of these very talented people is 
going to have to get cut. Or, I mean, many of these very talented people. But, you know, I'm seeing, like, five or six people at the top right now. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see. Very exciting season. I am stoked. Yes, me too. Now we're going to see what's on our back burner today. Woo. So Ms. Molly Boz, uh-huh. our friend of the pod, is soon back to be. on... <laughs> <laughs> soon to be friend of the pod is back on the youtubes if you didn't know it's her her um series and she's just doing like one series right now who knows if she's gonna do a different series because it's her dang youtube channel she can do whatever she wants mm-hmm. right now is called hit the kitsch hit the kitsch with hit molly, the bass. Kitsch, molly bass <laughs> <laughs> yeah she's making recipes from her cookbook cook this book uh, have you had a chance to watch any? She's got, uh, at this time of recording, four episodes up. Yeah, I watched the first episode, Pastrami Roast Chicken, and I also watched the White Bean Bolognese video because I was like, I might actually make that recipe, whereas all the other recipes were quite meatful. Meat, meaty. <laughs> yeah, I, I only watched the White Bean Bolognese at this time. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I think that Molly really knows how to build a brand. And I think that that is both hard to do in this day and age and extremely important if you are trying to make a living off of branding yourself, which she clearly is. But like you watch these videos, you can tell that there's like a design brief for the brand that is Molly Baz. She has these very consistent colorways. She uses her abbreviations all the time. That's very much part of her. She has these very... I want to say posh California vibes. Like, you look at her website, you look at her merch, you look at her cookbook, you look at her YouTube channel. It all fits in the same universe. It all screams Molly Baz. And I mean that as a compliment. I think she's doing it well. I think she's doing it in a smart way. And yeah, I enjoyed what I saw of this series so far. Yeah, it's it's definitely hit that California kitchen after your yacht club. Like. Yes. <laughs> Hanging out in the the LA beach all day Mm -hmm. vibes. But I mean, you know that from like her Instagram. Like you said, it's very consistent. If it's, if you like Molly, you will, you will like this because you like Molly. I mean, there's there's nothing she's doing differently. Totally. And going back to her Bon Appetit days, I've made a fair number of her recipes. I've liked every one I've made. There's several I've made multiple times, especially her sour cream and scallion biscuits. Like, those are great. (laughs) I've made them probably too many times to count. So in general, I do like her recipes. They do tend to not be vegetarian, which is a little bit of a stumbling block for me now. But I do Mm -hmm. also have her cookbook, so I feel like this is a good companion YouTube show. She has good little tips and tricks, which is always something I look for. Like, like what can this provide beyond what's in the cookbook? So I do think that it's, yeah, it's good as a companion. It definitely supplements the cookbook material. Yeah, for sure. Molly balls, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'd watch more with recipes that I would probably make. I'm not going to watch the like, here's how to make a steak video, <laughs> you know, but I'll watch other ones. Also, uh, Ham L. Whaley was on Jesse Sparks's The One Recipe podcast talking about tomb. I really like this podcast because they're very, very short, often around just like yes. 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you and me are definitely on the same page. We're like short stuff, perfect. <laughs> they all fall. Yeah, they're almost all under 15 minutes. Some are like six minutes, seven minutes. It's a very snappy show. And for those who don't know or don't remember, Jesse Sparks used to be an editorial assistant at Bon Appetit. So he is also hearkening back from the Bon Appetit days. I listen to this podcast pretty regularly, but not every single episode. Um, It's an enjoyable podcast. I do just, you know, pick out the chefs that I've heard of. In addition to Ham, Sola... Rick, Priya, and Andy have all been on the podcast as well. One of my favorite recipe developers online, Bettina Makalintel, was also, I believe, on the first episode of this podcast. So I've really been enjoying it. Oh, and also, friend of the podcast, Jesse Sheehan, was recently. Yes, on she was just on. Yeah. All our friends. I know. <laughs> all those snackable bakes. Yeah. All right. So, gosh, there's so much good content out there. <laughs> All right, moving on over to our shout outs. We just want to thank several fans of our potluck episode. <laughs> Ravenel said our dishes all looked beautiful. 
uh, Summer's Rising said, scones on point, Meg. <laughs> you know what? I, I deeply appreciate the comment, and I'm glad that they looked nice, but <laughs> they didn't taste so nice. And again, maybe that's on me. Oh, yes. I have a little bit of a follow-up to mm-hmm. this. I'm sorry to belabor it for you, Justine. But like, so I mentioned in the potluck that the scones ended up very dry and that it hurt my palate. And... I wasn't exaggerating. Like, coincidentally, I had a doctor's appointment a couple days later. Uh So I didn't go to the doctor because of the scones, but I was at the doctor anyway. And they're looking at my throat, you know, they're like, say, ah. And they're like, oh, you have like a a cut on your throat. And I'm like, I knew it. (laughs) (laughs) So Mary Berry scones literally injured me. End of story. (laughs) Oh, my God. I'm dead. (laughs) Maybe you got to stop getting hurt in the kitchen. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, yeah. Still not as bad as the eight stitches because of uh, the knife to the foot. I'll try to be more careful. Please. <laughs> oh, you're so precious. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, oh. so a uh, shout out, uh, lastly, to our friend Heidi from the Vibrant Visionaries, who said, that shake sounds disgusting. I applaud Amanda's effort. <laughs> Yeah, so she was agreeing with Amanda, just to provide a little more context. She wasn't saying, ah, Amanda, how could you? (laughs) But yeah, of course, lots of people enjoying Potluck, as always. They're very, it was a good episode. It was a really good episode, I will say. (laughs) I mean, I was there. I edited it. I enjoyed it. Five stars. (laughs) Speaking of five stars, give us five stars on your local (laughs) podcatcher. On Apple Podcasts, everywhere. Yeah, drop us a review, drop us an email. Get our merch at podappetite.threadless.com. Sign up for our newsletter on our website, podappetitepodcast.com. And also, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've got everything on there that if you listen to podcasts via YouTube, we are there. Uh Check us out. Get us... Please subscribe. We need some subscribers because of the way YouTube works. They won't let us like do anything until we have a certain number of, su- number of subscribers. It's true. <laughs> so stick it to the YouTube man and hit subscribe. <laughs> the algorithm. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's that's my Anne Reardon impression. Yeah. impression. <laughs> New season, Meg. Come on. <laughs> All right, thank you for joining us uh, this week. Next time on the podcast, we've got Jabibo episode three, Bread Week, and episode four, Mexican Week. Oh, boy. (laughs) I'm sure we will have a lot to say about Mexican Week. Oh, yes, we will. Oh, yes. All right, bye for now. Bye. Thanks for listening to Pot Appetit Gourmet Takes. We'd love to hear from you, so find us on Twitter and Instagram at pod underscore appetite. And on Facebook at Pod Appetit Podcast. You can also email us at podappetitepodcast at gmail.com and find all of our episodes on our website, podappetitepodcast.com. morning, Kelsey. I've got to tell you about this Regency romance I just read. Zoe, you're finished already? Oh, I couldn't put it down. Have you read anything new? (laughs) Not since you asked me yesterday. That's all right. I'll just find something I've read before. But Zoe, haven't you read and reread hundreds of these books? Well, they're my favorites. Far Off Places, Daring Damsels, True Love, and Dukes in Disguise. Since we both love these books so much, what if we made a podcast? Oh, but Kelsey... I insist! Well, all right, let's do it! Join us, real-life friends and real-life romance novel enthusiasts, every other week on Tea and Strumpets, a Regency Romance Review, as we discuss a book from our favorite genre and what makes it steamy or tepid. And, as the Regency period technically lasted only nine years, generally we're talking post-wigs, but pre-telephone. So whether you're looking for a book to add to your Tubi Red Pile, or you've read our choice already, we've got a little something for everyone. Read along or just listen in. You can find us on your podcatcher of choice, and new episodes coming every other Thursday. Thursday.